here at ILU, in the School of Education and Social Sciences, we actually train professional psychological counselors to help meet that need in the society. Our theology program also helps people to clarify who they are and their calling in life. If God is calling you to ministry, if you are a pastor or involved in other ministry in the church, then you need to receive biblical and theological education. And then also we have our program uh, in the area of course of leadership and governance. Our School of Leadership and Governance, we are uh, very committed to being part of the vision, an essential part of the one vision two, of developing one, leaders of integrity. Mic testing, one, two. And that's one of the reasons why we are appealing for more students, why I want to see more leaders raised at ILU. There are three areas that are important to us. One is raising leaders, of course, who not only are strong on character, but also have the competence and then they are able to engage in their context. My area of focus is on leadership and mainly focusing on values and norms of leadership for politicians. I serve as the executive director of Teen Challenge Kenya. That is a Christian rehabilitation program helping people out of the brokenness and bondage of addiction. So this provides formation. We believe that at this, our society, the nation can change if everyone who is living an institution like ours influences their immediate community and also the society. We promise that everyone who comes has a personal transformative experience. This is a uniquely designed uh, way of uh Welcome to International Leadership University, a premier leadership institution. This is the ILU Leadership Channel. Please click on the subscribe button below to ensure that you do not miss any of our insightful sessions. Welcome to the International Leadership University, a place of innovative learning where we train leaders of integrity. For over 10 years now, we've been positioned to serve you right where you are because of our innovative teaching. We started, first of all, by offering mobile phone learning over 10 years ago. And then we installed what we call an Eats Learning Platform where you can take your classes online. We are your partner in moving you to the next level of your calling, of your career, and of your dreams. We have three schools where we offer programs to empower you. We have the School of Leadership and Governance, where we offer a Bachelor in Leadership and Management, a Master of Arts in Leadership Studies, and a PhD in Leadership. We also have the School of Education and Social Science. And in this school, we offer a Bachelor of Arts in Counseling Psychology is, uh, Dr. and a Master Roach. of Arts in Counseling Studies. But I would like you to know that the bedrock and the foundation of our school is actually the School of Theology. That's where we began from. And our values and what we stand for have actually been formed in that school. Where we offer you a Bachelor of Theology program a Master of Arts in Biblical and Theological Studies, one, two, one, a two, Master of Divinity program, and also one, two, a one, PhD two, in one, Theological two, Studies. One, two, I want you to one, know that two, right one, from two, the comfort of your own home, one, two, or your office, one, two, or a favorite place where you can sit, one, two, you can access our education one, two, through a virtual private network. Testing. One, and two, through one, the virtual private network, you can get to read our journals, our books, testing. and every academic resource that we have in one, our life. Two, one, two. We are your partner, and we are ready to serve you. For more details, 
visit our website www.kenya.inu.edu Welcome to the University of Transformative Learning where we train leaders of integrity. Thank you for joining us on the ILU Leadership Channel. Remember to check out all of our transformational courses on leadership, theology, and psychology. You can also check out our short practical master classes from our consultancy division. Welcome to International Leadership University, a premier leadership institution. This is the ILU Leadership Channel. Please click on the subscribe button below to ensure that you do not miss any of our insightful sessions. My name is Alfred Karaoke. I learned a business uh, called Prios Limited, which I started when I was 26 years old. And we've been there now for slightly over 30 years. I am married with three children. All of them are adults working. Uh, one in the US and two. Actually, I joined ILU, where we are today, to do my bachelor's after having done a diploma at the University of Nairobi. And undergraduate was the BSc for leadership studies. And thereafter, I joined the master's class in leadership. I'm an alumni or an alumnus of ILU. Having uh, started my, our business, our family business, when I was a little bit young, uh, it gave me the opportunities of making mistakes, uh, falling down and waking up again. But th that was practice. So when I joined ILU, I saw what I was doing in theory. And uh, that uh, helped in sharpening my skills. Uh, which also became very handy when I went back to uh, after the course that I took. Yeah. Actually, after the BSc, our business started growing because of applying what we had learned here. And uh, after my master's, it became even better. I became a proper professional. It's good to realize that uh, the only alone cannot work in the business world. And um, practice alone without theory does not give you an enlarged scope of what you should do, and especially in overcoming problems. So it's important to have both uh, so that you can meet the challenges in business. There are so many things in business that uh, are not in the book. Chancellor at International Leadership University and I'm very happy to share with you briefly about our institution. Uh, the International Leadership University or ILU was started to taking the first students in 1981. So in 2021 we'll actually be celebrating 40 years of our contribution to higher education. One of the things that I will always celebrate for having attended the school at the time which was the Nairobi International School of Theology, later on the Leadership University, I was challenged to think about how the church is an agent of social transformation and uh, I was motivated 
uh, through the seminary to a point in which I was challenged to proceed in, uh, in pursuit of education. There's something special that ILU is doing that when you look at many other institutions, it is actually special and different. ILU is an institution that has trained so many leaders in this country that sometimes you won't know until you ask a person, where did you do your leadership training? And they will most likely say, ILU. Today, there is a great need for institutions that can build young people into people who are able to make a difference. There is nothing like the right preparation for being ready to do the right job. You know, in Kenya, we decry the fact that there are, there's, there's a gap in leadership, that young people are not being schooled and skilled and equipped for the, for the marketplace and the places that they need to be serving. This is an institution where it is, it, 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 there is a guarantee to the product that comes out because of the investment that is made through the academic program and as I have said, through the, the discipleship and deliberate installation of, of the values that will help young people make a difference. International Leadership University is unique in so many ways. The greatest of them is that it teaches the Christian leadership qualities. All the leadership skills and qualities are the spicing of the Christian values. It means that your moral values are likely to be at their best if you go to university in ILU. Well, let me tell you a little bit about our very exciting project that's coming up at Kitengela. This is a project that was conceived back in 2007. That's when the land was purchased and some of the initial uh, infrastructure such as the fencing and so on was put up to prepare for this important project. We have ILU has come up with a special, special, special facility designed for the 21st century student, one that is going to make a difference to the way they interact, one that gives them space because it is on an expansive piece of land located in Kitengera, Kajiado County. It is an institution that is going to be so special to them that they will not need to look any further. Uh, we need to expand because of need. We need to meet the needs of society. As you are aware, we are a leadership uh, university. So we want to impact the society with the leadership qualities so we can make a difference in the community. Uh, the challenges are uh, multiple. Uh, starting with the human resources to get the people to equip uh, the various aspects of expansion, uh, then the resources, uh, uh, mostly finance, uh, is a big challenge to us. Uh, and so that's really basically what uh, is uh, most significant. But uh, money to do the expansion is a challenge. My, the message I have is that they come, let's build the kingdom of God together. The Lord said when he was here on earth, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So we have a privilege, we have an opportunity to build the kingdom together with Christ. Uh, and this is a very good opportunity. So those who have, please come on board. Let us, you can give it, you can do it in kind and give us cash. There are many ways that have been created for people to contribute. Because we have an MOU and a very special arrangement with Kajando County, we are planning to continue training the leaders in Kajiando County to integrate courses that relate to the Maasai culture, courses that relate to the need of the people, not only in leadership, but also in culture. And of course, all the traditional courses of leadership, development, ILU has already been uh, given, a, uh, given a accreditation of so many of its courses. And for this reason, we are expecting that ILU is going to be the university of the future. We're putting up something I'm very excited about, a research center. 
because we believe we want to be on the cutting edge of knowledge to be able to raise new knowledge that's uh, you know uh, relevant to the context that will help us to apply what we learn and to be at the forefront of generating new knowledge so we have a research center conference center that will also serve as our center for our postgraduate students uh, to be able to expand that space and we want to be able to see leaders also come for a reflective experience so that they are able, you know, people who are already maybe you know, serving in different areas, come to, to the Kitangela campus and uh, over a two or three day period, have a retreat, have a, a time to reflect and to kind of re-energize for the next phase of their service. So the Kitangela campus will have many uh, ways in which it will contribute to complement what we are doing at the Kilimani campus, which will now remain as our city campus, but this will be able to offer us an opportunity to diversify. We are also, of course, able to have additional programs that we are hoping to launch to, as the country continues to change. We want to be relevant, and especially those programs that will be attractive uh, to the younger people that uh, we want to, to bring in, because this uh, will hardly, largely have the bachelor's campuses, as well as the research and conference center, as well as other facilities. We also will be partnering with the community again uh, through the health center, we'll also be having a chapel, we'll have a, a sports stadium and other ways that will make us a blessing to the community. We want to definitely be integrated to the community and bring blessing to that community. The institutions need you. The institutions need your support. Even if the country is going through a very, very challenging economic crisis right now, we are hoping that by the grace of God uh, we will recover but we can't wait until then we will still continue doing what can be done now and as one of the alumni and one who is invited to serve in the uh, steering team consulting with the head of the institution we are doing everything to support the vision and also to pray that even the current station which is like a hub will still continue to touch many lives we pray for the current students, and we'll be doing that in this recording, that you continue to be strong so that you can finish your program and go into the marketplace, go into the church, whatever community you work with, and make an impact for the kingdom of God. The Lord bless you. We are looking to expanding these facilities, and we are looking to you, a ministry partner, church, um, people in the institutions, out there in the corporate world, to come alongside ILU and make your difference in helping a young person, many young people in this country and across Africa, um, become the men and women that will make a difference in their society, in their generation, for life and eternity. I invite you to, to do that. Uh, Dr. Timothy Kirohe. I am the Vice Chancellor at International Leadership University and I'm very happy to share with you briefly about our institution. Welcome to International Leadership University, a premier leadership institution. This is the ILU Leadership Channel. Please click on the subscribe button below to ensure that you do not miss any of our insightful sessions. Not a panacea for everybody, but uh, what has worked for us, uh, referrals from other customers and uh, good citizenry of, our, uh, of uh, our workers, they are passionate. Despite the challenges that we face, and I would like to share this with, uh, we know people are being retrenched, people are restructuring, people have been uh, forced to go and leave. We sat down with um, uh, our workers, our staff, and we are like family. And we agreed there's nobody who's going to be forced to go and leave. And we shall be sharing the retro that we get so that not one single family will, uh, uh, will uh, have problems in terms of sustaining themselves. So you cannot have that if there is no cohesion between management and the employees. And uh, yes, they are good citizens. But we also have a flat uh, structure in our office. So you don't have the, the pyramid kind of uh, structures that getting to the boss is a nightmare. And uh, that really helps. Uh, the other thing is that um, 
one of the solutions that we have applied because of the restrictions of movement actually came from one of our employees. And uh, I would call uh, those who are in business to sit down with their workers because they know the problems they are facing, they have the solutions, give them an opportunity and you'll be surprised how, um, um, for lack of a better word, how fruitful they would be uh, in terms of the information that they'll give you. You'll find that they have solutions, but because you do not ask, you do never give them an opportunity, uh, they fear to come forward. And we must also trust in God. I don't know, I don't know, even those who do not believe God is there, uh, it's a good calling that they trust there is somebody bigger than them and uh, who looks after them and uh, our tomorrow will be better than today. And again, this is a learning curve. You go through problems that make you stronger in the future um, and use what you have learned during this crisis to have a better company, to become a better person, to become a better employer. And this crisis also reminds me, as human beings, to remember that we are equal. The, the mighty have been brought down uh, to the level of the smallest. So it's important that we coexist, uh, mutual respect, and knowing that at the end of the day, rich or poor, stronger or the weaker, we are all human beings. My brothers and my sisters who are in business, are you looking for a place or a school where you can improve your skills to overcome the challenges that we are meeting and especially this time of pandemic, uh, of this pandemic? The place is the International Leadership University whose pro proximity to your offices, town and uh, uh, communication is easy because the school is based at Kilimani, uh, commuting or driving uh, to this school uh, is easy, ample parking, ample resources in terms of uh, uh, lecturers and the likes. And this is the place where you have the best environment to take your studies. Short courses, long courses, it's your choice. Thank you for joining us on the ILU Leadership Channel. Remember to check out all of our transformational courses on leadership, theology, and psychology. You can also check out our short practical master classes from our consultancy division. Uh, the International Leadership University or ILU was started to taking the first students in 1981. So in 2021, we'll actually be celebrating 40 years of our contribution to higher education. One of the things that I will always celebrate for having attended the school at the time in which it was the Nairobi International School of Theology, later on the Leadership University, I was challenged to think about how the church is an agent of social transformation. And uh, I was motivated uh, through the seminary to a point in which I was challenged to proceed in, uh, in pursuit of education. There is something special that ILU is doing that when you look at many other institutions, it is actually special and different. ILU is an institution that has trained so many leaders in this country that sometimes you won't know until you ask a person, where did you do your leadership training? And they will most likely say, I L U. Today, there is a great need for institutions that can build young people into people who are able to make a difference. There is nothing like the right preparation for being ready to do it, to do the right job. You know, in Kenya, we decry the fact that there are, there's, there's a gap in leadership, that young people are not being schooled and skilled and equipped for the, for the marketplace and the places that they need to be serving. This is an institution where it is, it, 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 there is a guarantee to the product that comes out because of the investment that is made through the academic program and as I have said, through the, the discipleship and deliberate installation of, of the values that will help 
young people make a difference. International Leadership University is unique in so many ways. The greatest of them is that it teaches the Christian leadership qualities. All the leadership skills and qualities are the spicing of the Christian values. It means that your moral values are likely to be at their best if you go to university in IRU. Well, let me tell you a little bit about a very exciting project that's coming up at Kitengela. This is a project that was conceived back in 2007. That's when the land was purchased and some of the initial infrastructure such as the fencing and so on of water to prepare for this important project. We have, ILU has come up with a special, special, spacious facility designed for the 21st century student one that is going to make a difference to the way they interact, one that gives them space because it is on an expansive piece of land located in Kitengera, Kajiado County. It is an institution that is going to be so special to them that they will not need to look any further. Uh, we need to expand because of need. We need to meet the needs of society. As you are aware, we are a leadership uh, university. So we want to impact the society with the leadership qualities so we can make a difference in the community. Uh, the challenges are uh, multiple, uh, starting with the human resources, to get the people to equip uh, the various aspects of expansion, uh, then the resources, uh, uh, mostly finance, uh, is a big challenge to us. Uh, and so that's really basically what uh, is uh, most significant. But uh, money to do the expansion is a challenge. My, the message I have is that uh, come, let's build the kingdom of God together. The Lord said when he was here on earth, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So we have a privilege, we have an opportunity to build the kingdom together with Christ. Uh, and this is a very good opportunity. So those who have, please come on board. Let us, you can give it, you can do it in kind give us cash. There are many ways that have been created for people to contribute. Because we have a name for you and a very special arrangement with Kajiando County, we are planning to continue training the leaders in Kajiando County to integrate courses that relate to the Maasai culture, courses that relate to the need of the people, not only in leadership, but also in culture. And of course, all the traditional courses of leadership, okay. development, okay. ILU has already been uh, given, a, uh, given a accreditation of so many of its courses and for this reason we are expecting that ILU is going to be the university of the future. We are putting up something I'm very excited about, a research center, because we believe we want to be on the cutting edge of knowledge to be able to raise new knowledge that's uh, you know, uh, relevant to the context that will help us to apply what we learn and to be at the forefront of generating new knowledge. So we have a research center, a conference center that will also serve as our center for our postgraduate students uh, to be able to expand that space. And we want to be able to see leaders also come for a reflective experience so that they are able, you know, people who are already maybe you know, serving in different areas, come to, to the Kitangela campus and uh, over a two or three day period have a retreat, have a, a time to reflect and to kind of re-energize for the next phase of their service. So the Kitangela campus will have many uh, ways in which it will contribute to complement what we are doing at the Kilimani campus, which will now remain as our city campus, but this will be able to offer us an opportunity to diversify. We are also, of course, able to have additional programs that we are hoping to launch as the country continues to change. We want to be relevant, and especially those programs that will be attractive uh, to the younger people that uh, we want to, to bring in, because this uh, will hardly, largely have uh, the bachelor's campuses, as well as the research and conference center, as well as other facilities. We also will be partnering with the community again uh, through the health center, we'll also be having a chapel, we'll have a, a sports stadium, and other ways that will make us a blessing to the community. We want to definitely be integrated to the community and bring blessing to that community. The institutions need you. The institutions need your support. 
even if the country is going through a very, very challenging economic crisis right now, we are hoping that by the grace of God, uh, we worry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That's not a very good or encouraging response. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good that sounds better. Can we make it the best? Good evening once again, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and a great joy to welcome you to the International <clears throat> Leadership University. By the grace of God, we are committed to the noble task and the mission of developing leaders of integrity to steward and to uh, lead holistic transformation throughout Africa and the world. And it's an honor and a great joy indeed to be hosting a lecture, a public lecture, that deals with the subject of leading in challenging times. So with the tremendous joy that this uh, theme arouses in each one of us as we think about the question of leadership, the question of governance, and the question especially of values, as we hold them dear to our hearts and to our mission, we want to welcome you and to request you to feel at home right here. Thank you. Welcome. We're just about to start. Thank you. I can see some have even gone an extra mile to do a hardship. Um, and uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I mean, it just makes somebody feel that they are truly welcome. And uh, uh, I, I just want to request us, now that our VC and our chief guests are coming in, why don't we just stand up and just welcome them and appreciate them as they come in. What a privilege and what a blessing. And while we remain, we remain outstand, outstanding, we just want to pray together as we stayed, uh, start this uh, session together. It's a joy to have you, uh, every one of you. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are delighted, extremely grateful for the privilege and the honor to gather together in this hall as ILU and to be able to host a worthy guest who is going to be speaking to us on the vital subject of leadership and not just leading, but leading even in the midst of challenging circumstances. And Lord and our God, we thank you because you are the leader par excellence, so we should be concerned about issues of life. And we are grateful to you that we can be concerned about issues of life as they relate to the question of leadership. We are asking that you would bless this time together and that, Lord, should there be anyone on the road who has a genuine desire to be here and to be a beneficiary of the rich content and heart that will be shared by our chief guest. We pray that you would enable them to be here and that you would make the way possible for them to be able to maximize the benefit that accrues from this interaction. We bless you today. We love you, Abba Father. We pray that above all things that your presence will be with us in a very special and real way. And that, Lord, all of us will truly be engaged, will be engaged to participate, to listen attentively, and to ask questions that are relevant to uh, advancing the agenda of developing leaders of integrity so that, Lord, we can be able to not just desire transformation, but we ourselves to be agents of transformation wherever you have placed us. Be magnified, be exalted, and be glorified. We welcome you to have your way. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Just remain uh, yeah, on your feet because I want to request our very own Dr. Purity Gitonga to come and uh, lead us because she is the moderator of this session. And I do not have the permission 
to let you people sit down until she gives us the permission to do so. So over to you. Welcome her. Let's encourage her. As she comes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Davidson Mwangi. May I kindly request you to sit down? <laughs> Thank you. Let me say it's a pleasure, it's a honor, and we are thankful to God for this day and for this time that he has enabled us to be here. Um, we are glad to have our chief guest with us. Allow me to point it out that the chief guest was here very, very early. May we appreciate that. We are talking of leadership, and uh, that's where it starts, and we want to really appreciate that. So I, I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the International Leadership University. As you've been told, it's a university that develops leaders of integrity, and we are grateful to be part of that. So most welcome. I want to welcome and recognize all of you, each one of you, and those of us are online feel most welcome. Wherever it is that you've joined us from, feel most welcome. I want to specifically recognize the presence of Airnet, the representative of Airnet. Is he here? Yes, that's um, representative of Airnet. So welcome. Um, that's an organization that deals with ethics and leadership. I'm, I'm aware that there are representatives from the Taveta. Thank you very much. All the way from Taita, Taveta, and from Wajia, we feel honored by your presence. Feel most welcome, and we are happy. Um, let me ask, if you are not from ILU, please do stand. We want to recognize you. If you are not from ILU, kindly do stand. So many of you, thank you very, very much. Thank you, feel most welcome. Um, if time would have allowed, I would ask, you can quickly say which organization you represent. Quickly. My name is David Chuma. I work with the National Police Service. Um, Air Wing, Wilson Airport. Okay. Thank you very much, National Police. Air Wing, Wilson Airport. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At the back. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Bernard Chia. I'm an auditor. I work with the from Port Colesters. Okay, thank you. That's an auditor. Welcome. Next, please. Hi, everyone. Good. My name is Sam. Uh, I'm a former student, but uh, I am an alumni company. Welcome. That's an alumni of ILU. Thank you, Karibu Sana. Thank you, save the children. Thank you very much. You may sit after you introduce yourself, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Grace Kamasara, Taraka University. Thank you. That's the Raqqa University, um, quite from the other side of the country. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Good evening. My name is Grace Mother. I'm a director for Program and Absolutely Consultant. Okay, thank you. National Consultant. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good evening. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Jiko, University of Nairobi. You may sit. From there? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you and welcome. Good evening.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Rose. Good evening. Thank you very much. Welcome to ILU. I've seen two other people walking. Okay. Yes, understand. You're introducing yourself. Good evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That is, um, uh, you work with the Sindian Bank, Baraka. Thank you very much. Karibu. Yes. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I guess you can see he looks like me. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, feel most welcome, every one of you. Sorry, there's somebody else we missed. Good evening. Okay. Again, Wajia County, former MCA. Thank you very much and welcome to ILU. May I ask the ILU family to stand? Thank you, thank you, that's the ILU family and I'm sure they'll be recognized in a better way by the VC, so most welcome. And all those online do feel most welcome to today's program. With that, I now want to take this opportunity to welcome the Vice Chancellor of International Leadership University, Dr. Tim Kirui, to come and address us. At the same time, welcome our chief guest. So may we appreciate him and welcome him as he comes. Thank you and feel welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Getonga. Good evening. And uh, it's a real joy to have you uh, here, both those of you who are here present in person, as well as the online audience that is following this lecture. Uh, we know that there is a good number. So how many so far, uh, Nicholas? 53, so almost a bigger number than here, uh, following online. And I'm sure that uh, many more are going to be joining as well. Uh, this evening, we have a, a real great opportunity uh, I'm sure to listen to someone who has uh, walked the trail of leadership, because this is what we are at the University of Leadership. Um, and, uh, but before I talk about her, just to say that for those of you who are here at ILU for the first time, as was mentioned, our slogan is helping develop leaders of integrity. We know that that's a very needed uh, facet, our value in our society maybe more needed than anything else, more than money. <laughs> I know right now we are feeling the pinch of the economy, but more than money, <laughs> we actually need integrity because even to manage that money needs integrity, isn't it? So that's what we believe we are supplying what our country needs. And we have, th we have three outcomes that we, we promise those who come, including our student, our potential student who is joining us in January, that there are three areas that we believe are critical for developing a whole person. One, is an area, of, of course, of competencies. Uh, that's what you sign for. That's why you come here, because you believe that there are certain competencies, whether in the area of leadership and governance, and that program has got, uh, you know, or that school has got programs in the area of business administration, in marketing, uh, Christian ministry leadership, and other areas of leadership, uh, you know, that are, that are involved, um, you know, to be able, an organizational development as well. At the higher levels, at the PhD level, uh, because we offer leadership all the way to the PhD level, we have educational leadership, we have corporate leadership, uh, we have uh, Christian ministry leadership, and we also have public governance uh, because, of course, of the importance of devolution and taking leadership to the counties. So we have all those areas, and uh, I'm glad to say that uh, even some of our graduates in the PhD program are here with us. 
Uh, so uh, the first graduate is actually right here with us tonight. The second area that we focus on is area of uh, mental health and wellness or counseling psychology. Again, it's become very, very, in a very short span of time, it's become a very key area of our, of our society, isn't it? And uh, we want, of course, want to have a well society, a society that is whole. And so we have programs in that area from certificate all the way to the master's level uh, that we are able to help with. And finally, we also are looking at competences in the area of uh, you know, values and spirituality. So our school used to be the International, Nairobi International School of Theology long, long ago before it transformed to the International Leadership University. So we have also have programs in the area of theology and we offer that again all the way to the PhD as well with various concentrations. So I just want to let you know that uh, we are committed to offering uh, competences at the best level possible. And we are regulated, of course, all our programs are accredited by the Commission for University Education to ensure that we continue to offer programs at the highest level. But more important than competence, much as importance, competence is important, we believe is character. It's a foundation of, of leadership. It's a foundation of long-term service for every individual. And so we talk about integrity. Integrity is actually a measure of character, of your character. And so we believe that for you to have a good foundation for your career, for your you know, uh, service, your, your, for your marriage, for whatever you do in life, character is important because it is on the basis of character that you'll be trusted and everything is built on trust, uh, whether it's leadership, whether it's, you know, whatever else you do and so on. And finally, we also want to raise and develop leaders who are connected to the context. I think it is in this country where we have a, a slogan that, uh, you know, ground, vituni, different, you know. <laughs> we don't want to just raise ivory tower, you know, intellectuals. We want people who are able to engage with their context to bring transformation. And part of what we do, uh, the students will tell you, is that uh, every year we have an opportunity for them to go and take everything they have learned so far and seek to bring transformation to a community. We did that in Kajiado West last year. This, this year we were somewhere in uh, uh, Mount Elgon, uh, looking at maybe communities that need significant help to bring transformation. Maybe our friends from Wajia County now should invite us for the next one. <laughs> we'll be happy to come alongside and see what, how does our learning and training really impact things on the ground, because that's, what, that's important uh, to make sure that people are connected and so on. So those are the, the, the three things we desire, and I trust that even tonight will be a form of delivery that I'm sure will bring that about. Just, uh, there are many things I could talk about our guests tonight, and first of all, to just say how we are honored as a university that she accepted our invitation uh, to come and speak to us. Uh, our guest tonight uh, is uh, a professor of management at the Kenya School of Government, um, and also has served as well at the University of Nairobi, as uh, you may know. She also serves as a chancellor. Uh, she's in the, in the area of academics at, for St. Paul's University. And I'm happy to tell you, uh, our guest speaker, that uh, the vice chancellor of uh, St. Paul's University is our alumnus here from this university. So we are happy to have made a contribution in that way to St. Paul's University. And uh, she was also um, have had took her, uh, uh, received her PhD from in human resource education from the University of Illinois and also a Master of Education from uh, Kenny, uh, Kenyatta University, and then uh, her BA also from the University of Nairobi. She, of course, has served at all the levels. I was fascinated to hear her say she taught at high school because most of us know where she ended. <laughs> so she understands the journey all the way from high school to university, uh, serving, of course, as the executive director at the Kenya School of Government. Uh, which was my first acquaintance, and then also at uh, now at the, the cabinet, as a cabinet secretary, uh, you know, in, in the previous administration, in the area of public service, youth, gender, uh, social protection, and also special programs or the ASAO programs as well from 2018 to 2022. Before that, she was a chairperson at the Public Service Commission, and also a vice chair of the Judicial Service Commission from 2013 to 2018, and. Uh, one of the reasons why we felt especially that I should be more suited to come and speak tonight is because we know that she transformed the then Kenya Institute of Administration, or helped transform together with others, her team, to the Kenya School of Government, which became a Pan-African training institution of choice. Uh, I've had the privilege of interacting with them a little bit, and I knew that uh, the people would come from even other countries of Africa to come and train 
at the, um, you know, the Kenya School of Government. She has uh, been the recipient of the Order of Grand Warrior, the First Class Order of the Chief of Burning Spear, the Moran of Golden Heart, and also the Elder of Golden Heart uh, by the Republic of Kenya in uh, the various years. She's also been re recognized in the year 2014. She received the recognition for the Africa's Most Influential Woman in Business and Government, an award by, a, uh, you know, awarded by the CEO Magazine of South Africa, and also at the international level, was a member of the UN Committee of Experts on Public Ad Administration from 2017 to 2021. Um, she has many other distinguished services as she has given to our nation and beyond. And uh, tonight, and it is a real delight uh, for us to be able to put our hands together and bring to speak to us on this important topic, uh, Professor Margaret Kobia. Would you kindly uh, put your hands together as she comes to speak to us? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Please have your seats. Let me start by recognizing the Vice Chancellor and the entire leadership of International Leadership University uh, for really inviting me here. And uh, I'm very happy to share this particular public lecture with you. Let me also recognize the director of the program, Dr. Purity Kitonga, the whole team of IROU, and also the spouse of the director of the program, Sam Kitonga, who is already here, and all of you participants, and at the same time recognizing the participants who are online. We are together in this. What I would like to say, I think, uh, how I got to be invited in this particular event is the relationship I've had with Dr. Tim Kirui, having been one of my facilitators at Kenya School of Government. I think this is lesson number one, the power of networks. That you can just take a phone and call me and tell me we are planning to have this public lecture and we think you can do it. And uh, to cut the story short, I just said this is a payback period. <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time for all of us to know how important it is to invest in our skills of networking. Who can you call within a short notice because they know and they trust you and they can come to your event. I think that is something worthy to invest. Let me also say that uh, thank you for a very elaborate introduction. But in addition to that introduction, I like telling people my biggest achievement in life is bringing up three grown-up children who are making a contribution to the society. And that, <laughs> that then tells us as leaders, how do we deal with work-life balance? I'm a wife, of course, I'm a mother, and uh, of course, a grandly mother. And then, of course, I had these careers right from teaching in high school, colleges, university, Kenya School of Government, Public Service Commission, and of course, the last appointment, which I think you have all been stood. So, Balancing life, because it's like asking, as leaders, can we have it all? Can you have a successful family? Can you also have a, a successful career? That is something we also always need to invest and get it right. So I think with those many remarks, I just want to go straight to, to the presentation that I, where I was helped very much to put together. Dr. Motua, where are you? Can you stand? Please give her a hand. And also, Nandian, if you've seen, also, you really supported in putting together. Thank you very much. I told your VC, yes, I'm willing to do it, but I don't think I'm willing to do a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> 
But say no worry about that. I have some faculty members who can assist. So really, thank you very much for really that help because it has made it possible for us to share this public lecture. So don't blame the two faculty if something doesn't go right here. <laughs> they did their best, the rest of was me to look at it and then synthesize and decide this is what we want to share as researchers and also as practitioners. So that's what we are going to do today. So very quickly, I will turn to speak on leading in challenging times. And I will see you wondering, because we are all leaders, are there times that is not challenging for a leader? <laughs> you must ask yourself that. And then I said for us to start off, off, I think it's important to ask some questions. As a way of starting reflecting on leading in challenging times. And we must ask ourselves, why do some leaders succeed while others fail? Our leaders are different levels. Because one leader can succeed while another one fails. Number two, what changes have we experienced? In the last two years, we are so because we are talking about challenging times. And how did you, the leadership that surrounds you deal with it? That is a question at the end of this lecture we should answer or not at the end of this lecture, even in your own time. Why do leaders say that the hardest part of leading is in challenging times is people? The hardest part of leading is leading people. Why? At the hardest part of leading, people are the most difficult uh, components of managing during challenging time. Why does our leadership matter, and especially more during challenging times? Where is the evidence? You know, being at university, you are supposed to have evidence that during challenging times, the type of a leader required is different from an ordinary leader. Therefore, where is the evidence? What can we read and say from that authority? It shows that during challenging time, we need a leader who has these kind of competencies. And the reason why I'm saying that, sorry. What does the Bible say? This is a Christian university. What does the Bible say about leaders and the leadership? I think there are several, if you are to look at the leadership, maybe on the search, there are several areas you could find around leadership. So we cannot forget to say what does the Bible say about leadership. It could be a Bible, it could also be a Quran. And I'm sure if we stuck to what the Quran and the Bible says about leadership, we will be better version of leaders than we are today. About this public lecture, I just wanted to remind ourselves, a university does not just waste time putting together a public lecture. But this is a, a traditionally accepted as a high level forum to address critical society issues, which must complement the learning that takes place here, the teaching, and the service. There are many other things universities do, but the core is learning, teaching, and service. And I think the Vice Chancellor did say that this university concerns itself with societal issues that are either barriers to our development or if we are able to solve these social issues, then we would be a better equal society here in Kenya and uh, elsewhere. This lecture is based on literature review where we have read what various authorities in leadership are saying, and then thereafter looked at the experience and then extracted what we are presenting here today. Let me also say, leadership is relatively a new discipline, which is like 60 years since researchers started generating knowledge, content, and a body that today we can talk about this as leadership. You remember, we know much about management, which is as old discipline, maybe as we talk about economics or other disciplines. But we know leadership is relatively new. In the management, 
we had the functions of management, which would say planning, organizing, coordinating, leading, and controlling. We would only talk about leading at one of the function of management. Therefore, we must see leadership as evolving from management. And when you are situating this body of, lag, uh, body of knowledge for leadership, we must also be able to connect it with the management. And also the public uh, lecture paper will be given, including this presentation. So maybe for you to engage listening and taking notes for the purpose of maybe asking the question towards the end of the lecture. So we'll be able to share uh, the paper that Dr. Mutua and Nandian and myself, we have said this is the paper people could look at because at the university you just don't come and just talk things from your head. You are expecting to have researched look at what various authorities are saying, and also look at the context and be able to share that. But uh, what do we know about leadership up to today? These are reflections. We could define leadership as the most researched and debated area of social sciences today. One of the most, and you could find many writers, including authorities in academics like George, Jim Collins, I think you all know him. Jim Maxwell, you all, all of you who are practitioners know him and what he has written about leadership. But despite all these studies that have been done, we don't seem to have an agreed definition of leadership. If I asked you, each one of you what is leadership, each one of you can easily come up with a aversion. That becomes problematic. Therefore, with all the research is done, we don't have that. Again, we are finding that the leadership is most understood, misunderstood. It is very controversial. And are, we are hearing value-based leadership, authentic leadership. We are also told leadership is not a position. It is at all levels. Does it get complicated? And then we are, we are, we are also told even if leadership is not a position, I submit that position is also important because it gives power and authority, isn't it? The VC can say tomorrow you don't come and actually won't come. <laughs> so much as we say leadership is at all levels, it's very important. But at the same time, it is important in my view, I believe that leadership is not a position. Leadership is about serving others. Once you distill it to that, that leadership is about serving others. It's not about you, it's about others. Then you are at peace to see then leadership is at all levels. You may ask ourselves, how come two homes separated by a fence, one family does so well, the children go to school, of them, they secure jobs, but another one, they become a dropout. It is the leadership within those homes. And actually, a lot of literature is trying to say, are there similarities between leadership and the parenting? That's a question you can answer another day. Because it's something you can have best ways of parenting can differ from one person to another, from one home to another. But it is leadership that makes one home succeed and the other one does not. However, it is, I can submit to you that it is agreed Leadership is the determinant. One institution succeeds, and another one does not succeed. Then if, if we have to work around leadership, we must give it an operation definition. It is always needed, because what are we talking about when we say leadership? Unless as scholars, as practitioners, we can be able to give an operation definition in your context, then you might lose the validity and the reliability of your research. Then, uh, I don't know if there's something I've left. Then we find theories and the evolution of leadership and why it matters. I'm sure you can reflect. Long time ago, maybe 100 years ago, do you think the leadership of those hundred years ago is the same now? Or do? What do leaders do? Do leaders direct? Do leaders motivate? 
Do leaders, what exactly do they do to achieve results? Because the leadership is about the results. And they said then, we need to see what leaders do, use what we have come as evidence of what leaders do to argument with threat. Then they also argued, if there's what about leaders do, then even people with the threat can be taught. Because the behavior you see in behavioral leaders then can be used, those traits can be taught to other people. Then the two theories were still being questioned that still with the trait theory, behavioral theory, we do not understand the whole totality of a leader. And then, of course, they came with contingent theories or situational theories that says a leader is effective depending on the situation they find themselves in. And it, I've given just a few, but if you go to such theories of leadership, you can even come with 15. But for purpose of this presentation, I thought we just look at a few, because even within contingency and situation, it could be divided into several. And then there is what we call new, means new, charismatic theory, which is about transformation. Leaders, this one foresees and can profile risk can look what is likely to happen five to 10 years to come and what we need to do as a leader to be able to mitigate in, within that co context. And I'm sure you can perhaps, maybe other theories now also we involve if there is somebody questioning a transformational leader, changing the institution, and then growing people, or what makes them that, what can we say is what they have transformed in terms of themselves, in terms of the institution that they work, and with what results. Of course, we will also hear about transitional leaders, transaction leaders. They are about more of managing administratively just to pass to somebody else, which is very different. I think it's always been important to try to understand and differentiate between transactional leaders and the transformative leaders. This is also a very interesting area. After looking at the theories, then you hear their leadership styles. And historically, we know the autocratic leader, that is the one who makes all decisions. Democratic is a bit consultative. Less as is fair is you are free to do whatever you want to do. I want to submit to you today, there's no one, no one one of them which is better than the other. A leader might, depending on different situations, either combine the two, center on one, and that's why you find there are leaders who are people-oriented, that they tend to be, that's why you are hearing a lot of cooperative leadership nowadays, participatory leaders, because they are more people-oriented, they want to help people. But you can also find the others who are very task-oriented, and right now you would ask, which way? Do we become people-oriented as leaders? Do we become task-oriented? A task-oriented leader, if you call to say you are sick, they only understand you. not sick at all, because they are very task-oriented. Therefore, in your thinking, which way would it be better? I can tell you, sometimes there's no one way. So sometimes you might find yourself, you are more people-oriented, so other times you are task-oriented, but trying to find the kind of I mean, way to, to achieve the results. I wanted us to recognize in research, leadership theories are very much influenced by the variables. Because in research, you must have variables that you are working around or manipulating to get exactly to understand what is leadership. We find leadership is also influenced by a value like age. I don't know what is your argument. Do younger leaders do better than old leaders? So can we say in this organization, you know they're doing very well because the leader is younger? Where is the evidence? Or this organization is dying because the leader is too old, does not understand the context of time. That's another argument. Then gender, is leadership 
theory influenced by gender. Women leadership and men leadership, are they the same? How do people perceive a woman leader or a man leader? And of course, there's a lot of literature you can find around, around that. Other people argue, besides this, qualification of a leader matters. And that, this time you are also thinking, we have different categories of leaders. And that's why he said at the beginning, leadership is misunderstood, it's controversial, because qualification of leader, there is religious leaders, there are cultural leaders, there are politician leaders, there are different type. Of, what is their qualification? And what gives them that qualification so that people feel that the qualification of a leader matters? Occupation, there are people who feel the occupation of a leader influences them to become more influential in that areas. And of course, you have seen a lot of argument that if it's a, a particular institution, and recently we had a hospital, they were very against being led by a CEO who is from nursing background. <laughs> in the universities, we have argued a lot. Do we need a professor in the university, or do we need somebody who has done business administration courses? So that they can run universities as a business. So that can also influence occupation. The skills that they have, knowledge, and also problem-solving uh, abilities. So, so if you are to stand the leadership, then you have to bring on board these variables that will influence and affect teacher, uh, uh, leadership so that you can be able to understand them. But how the challenging time look? We are finished now with the whole area of looking at the leader, who he is, who they are, what they do, and also the standards and the evolution of uh, leadership. I thought we needed to dispense that so that we have that kind of understanding. Then now we move to how challenging times look like to a leader because this topic is uh, managing during challenging, leading during challenging times. In my view, I thought turbulent times are what brings kind of challenging times. There could be global crisis, such as pandemic, we have just gone through the COVID-19, political instability, an organization could find itself in the middle of the politics, maybe depending on where they stood in the last campaign. You could also find, maybe because of the change of government, or besides that, political instability that interferes with the organization. Economic recession is another area that I've found, leaders have found it very, very difficult. If you don't have enough resources to run your organization, then that is turbulent time for a leader. Financial crisis, technological change. We are talking about digital technology. If an organization has not embraced the technology, and now, for example, when we had COVID-19, most of the universities that did well, or running institutions that did very well, is those who had embraced digital technology. Therefore, it's very important to know where the, the challenges are coming from. Mergers and acquisition, because sometimes organization designed, let's come together because individuals were not doing well. So if you manage staff, and you manage plans, then under their strategic plan, that can be quite a turbulent time for, for an organization or for a leader. Policy, policy shift. And I think recently we have had very many policy shifts, not in the, even both in Kenya and out of Kenya. When there's a new policy, maybe like the one of taxation, or when there's a new policy in education, you can easily be thrown off balance. Therefore, you need somebody who understands how a policy shift should influence the planning and what change they are supposed to bring in their institution. Restructuring, you find a lot of institutions, the management or the leadership looks at how they are performing and they find they are not doing as well as they want to, to, to be uh, known for. And they say, we have to restructure so that we start with a strategic plan. And that strategic plan will be able to tell us how many departments, how many divisions should we have. And then that will be able to inform us how many members of staff do we want in that structure. That is a complete turbulent time, and the leader should normally find even people. Just as we say, the hardest part of change is the people. People will be wondering, how is that restructuring going to touch my job? Am I going to be 
lose my job or which departments am I going to fit? Demographic trends is a big area, especially if it's an organization which are of a sudden, like if sometimes in government you find maybe you have hired a thousand people, and all of them are the same age. They come and they find people like us who have been there for a long time. Their views are different, their thinking is very different, and therefore how do you embrace when demographic uh, character changes of, of staff so that when I'm talking about working in this organization for too long, then they are saying working in an organization for three years is too long. They want to move on. And also their working environment is different. So that to any leader who is not prepared can, can have a lot of difficulties. Climate change or the impact of climate change, which is affecting almost everybody. Therefore, I was just giving an example that we need to know what brings challenging time and the rapid changes taking place globally or regionally or nationally can bring turbulent time to any leader that they need to stop and think. But a leader does not work alone. They work with their boards, they work with their teams. Therefore, it's very important also, when there are turbulent times, then you ask, how can we be able to overcome? What needs to be done? And I, I believe Alinda is not the only source of information of what needs to change. The above situation calls for a transformative leader with a shared vision. You know, a lot of us we have talked about a vision, but a vision is useless unless it's shared. You must share the vision to the lowest person. I think there, there's a, an article which was saying, even a person who is sweeping this room understands I'm sweeping it to make your university and get, so that that shared vision that leaders have spent time to make everybody understand in their teams, in their organization, what the university or institution is, is pursuing. And a leader who can positively influence people first to transform themselves, by the way, I think it's very important to know you don't transform an institution unless you, you transform yourself. Change starts with yourself, but also there's a process. Then once they, they transform themselves, they're able to uh, transform the organization and they deliver. You know, leadership is not about, it's about are you delivering the results? Are you delivering the goals? Therefore, that emphasizes even before the leader really settles down, he must know what are the indicators of the plan or what are the, what, where do we want, what are the goals that we must deliver in year one, year two, year three? How do we know that we are uh, uh, achieving those goals? Otherwise, you cannot be a leader if you are not about delivering something. Even a leader within your family, you must have a vision of how your family needs to be so that if the children finish that at one stand primary school, then go to, you can see that is an indicator they are moving. But if you don't seem to have had a vision that is shared by all of uh, everybody in the household, then it becomes a little bit challenging. So I think I wanted to, to just give a little bit uh, of my example, not that I'm saying I was the best, but there are lessons I learned. I would have said they are challenging. One such time is when I, I tell you I worked with the team here to develop some program with the vision 2030 in 2008, the government decided in Kenya Institute of Administration deemed to be transformed to Kenya School of Government. That's been giving it a broader mandate and from what KIA was doing. That, of course, is turbulent time for the council, for the staff, faculty, and for the, for, for, uh, for every, including for myself. So what we, are, what we are supposed to have transformed, of course, it is a review of the whole curriculum, review of governance, building infrastructure. And in that, of course, required a lot of changes. In that journey, I think we were able to transform KIA to Kenya School of Government, and I'm sure those of you who have been to Kenya School of Government is still is able now to train all the senior government officials, including PSs, CSs, because of that transformation. And I also say, you cannot be a leader who, when you leave your institution, dies. Are we together? Mm -hmm. If you are, if you leave an institution collapses, 
then you should also remember that you are not a very good leader. So good leader invest in institutional strengthening and also strengthening people. Then when I went to Public Service Commission, I was given an assignment to recruit Chief Justice. In the process of recruiting Chief Justice, of course there are many interests from executive, from NGOs, from parliament, and there here is an institution that must have a Chief Justice a year before the general election, because if you don't have, you will be in total darkness if there is somebody going to court because of uh, uh, conflict in uh, presidential election. So I felt that was quite turbulent, where we had to work a day and night. I chaired the commission that was advertising, interviewing, and actually announcing the chief justice, which means that time also the staff within judiciary are also looking at you. What is that you are going to do and what is guiding you so that you do the right thing? And when finally you say this is our chief justice, is accepted by the entire country. I think through grace of God, you are able to do it, and this is how Chief Justice Maraga was appointed. <laughs> then I, when I went to the Ministry of Public Service, I think all of you remember NYS1 and the NYS2, do you? <laughs> what had happened, it found issues, theft by public, and uh, by that time, the government was feeling that if we have another NYS, I think the whole institution will be closed. So what did we do? Working with the, the team of the PS and other senior government officials, we decided National Youth Service was a department under the Ministry of Public Service. So the PS in the ministry is supposed to oversee National Youth Service, which is far off and with a budget bigger than the ministry. Therefore, that created a lot of loopholes for anybody to do tender, and you know the Kenyan context, how sometimes we can not follow the procurement procedures, and then, of course, we lost the money. That is also, now we decided, with the consultation of everybody who else would need them to be consulted, we needed now to transform National Youth Service to a semi-autonomous government institution that will still continue dealing with uh, training national youth service, both paramilitary and also for service, for, because that's why they established. With that, we decided then we needed to new, have a new act. One of the biggest challenges to preparing something like a, an act is very political. There are interest groups who want to see the act that has come into force, their views have been heard or they have been explained why they can't have that. So today, national youth service is having National Youth Service Act with its council and the whole issue of governance was sorted. And once the governance is sorted, then the internal financial controls, the human resource uh, operations procedures are put in place. That's what I would say were difficult times during my years of service and working through those. Of course, as, as I asked you before, every time a Linda is always having challenges. But there are times which might take you completely out of your comfort zone. So what are the three areas that I learned? I learned as a leader, you must contextualize and accept the change. You must understand it. What is changing? By scanning the environment, what is this big change that has taken place within the environment that you need to understand with your team? Then you have to do the strategic planning. Once you have a plan, because you must have a plan that you want to deliver, it will then inform you in this plan what kind of specific key resort areas, the type of people you require, how you are going to evaluate this so that everybody understands. It requires a lot of foresight and visioning, execution, measurement and evaluation, and the, the role of evidence. You know, if you have to make a decision and it's not informed by any data, then as a leader, you are likely to make a mistake. Therefore, you must always ask, if we want to make a certain decision, what data do we have that can help us uh, make the, this decision? I'm sure that's why sometimes, maybe in the universities, if they want to combine two or three departments to make it a faculty, they look at the number of students. 
and they look at, they already make up their mind that the, what drives their result is maybe faculty. They say we have enough faculty, but if we combine, we can be able now, with the faculty we have, we can have more, we can save on the cost. Then the second thing that I learned, ensure effective governance and structures. I think if you have to really manage during challenging time, you have to have the governance in place. And that mostly it would be the accountability. And I know a lot of institutions have the either board of governance, they will have a council. And if the management does not work very well with the, the council or the board, then it becomes a problem. So fix the governance to deal with accountability, integrity, transparency, competence, policy and legal coherence. I think this is very important because a lot of institutions, people struggle because there's no policy. Are we together? That people are asking in this organization, how are people recruited? How are people promoted? I'm talking especially when I was the Public Service Commission. How are you trained? But, but if you have a human resource operations manual, then nobody needs to ask any question. And this one is also developed in consultation and participation of the team. So policy first, then you have the legal, uh, uh, the, the legal document that will help you. Kind of everybody knows this is what guides us. Of course, there are many interests. You have to take interest of various groups. You have to think about inclusion. You have to think about participation, but above all, sustainability. Yeah, because you can succeed now, but how is it going to survive in the four or five years time? So that is one thing I learned that having a very effective governance is very important and it will take care of all those I have listed. People engagement at all levels is important. You have to explain the theory of change. The theory of change just says, what is changing, why it is changing, how will it affect me? If you don't take time really to explain that, and then what plan, what strategic plan do you have that accommodates that? So that is the, only, the reason why staff will never come with you if they don't feel they have been engaged and at all levels. Not just maybe the management, but from the management, they also need to go to the other, uh, other levels until the last person from the highest to the rules, they know what is changing and why the change has took place and how it is going to affect them. And the opportunity to voice uh, their concerns. You may not be able to address all the concerns, but you might be able to bring it to a team who try to distill all the concerns that the staff have. The one thing I think we can do when we are managing during challenging time is to ignore the, what the staff are saying or what even other stakeholders. First of all, you must have your stakeholders analysis so that you'll be able to know, this is my stakeholder, and what do I need from this particular stakeholder? What level, what level of communication do you need to give to this stakeholder so that they can come with you in these challenging times? Then I was uh, looking at, very quickly, a transformation model of a leader. What competencies would you really look for? for a leader who is able to lead during challenging time. This is not organized in any form, but I thought it's something that out of the literature that we were looking through, we could see that for sure I could submit to you that there are three levels that you need to, a transformation leader to need to have those competencies. Like the conceptual ability that you are, through cognitive ability, you are able to conceptualize, you are able to vision, you are able to do strategic thinking. Like I said, what is changing? You might be able to see what framework is influencing that change. So we can also learn how to conceptualize and be able to communicate that concept, the concept, conceptualization ability. The other ability that you need to bring is technical expertise. I think all of us bring a certain technical expertise in the institution that you work. You're either a teacher, you're an accountant, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor. But if you are not up to date with your technical expertise, then you also lose credibility. And once you lose credibility as a leader, then the people cannot look up to you. And I'm almost saying now, 
simple definition of a leader is somebody who can influence you to, to, to kind of to follow a certain decision. We are told that Linda knows the way, know, goes the way and goes with you. So it's very important that if you don't have also the interpersonal skills, team skills, those three, I would want to submit that without conceptual ability, technical expertise, and interpersonal skills, it becomes very difficult for a Linda to manage through turbulent times. For technical expertise, I know a lot of organizations, a lot of professional bodies have their own body where you keep updating your, that, your, your, your technical expertise so that you know the latest knowledge in your area of expertise. Without that, as a leader, you lose credibility. I think it's important I say that because a lot of leaders get kind of settled and sometimes they don't keep themselves up to date with evolving knowledge. I can imagine now, like in digital technology, uh, I don't think any university would want to keep a lecturer who cannot teach online. <laughs> well, we, did we learn that in the university? So I think it's very important also everybody asks in the area, how are we retooling ourselves so that we become relevant during challenging times? Communication, listening, and empathy. That's why I said it's not organized in any way because communication could even affect the interpersonal skills. We were told 25% of the productivity of any organization is as a result of effective communication. 25%. Leave alone finances, leave alone the people, the efficiency of communicating. Because you must communicate what the goals, you must communicate the vision, you must communicate what is changing. So communication is very important. In my view, and from my experience, I was not a very good listener. So I learned you need to give staff time to tell you their story. It is theirs. And of course, you are not also going to have a whole day listening to a staff. So having that, <laughs> uh, having that kind of finding a balance is very important. Listening is something we have to learn. Just as we think also, networking is something you have to learn. Networking is very, very important, especially for seniors, small, maybe having a small talk. A lot of us, me included, because I'm an introvert, that's another thing, understanding self, know yourself, self-awareness. But when you are thrusted in this job where you have to go and meet with other people, talk, you are just wondering, when is this cocktail going to end? <laughs> because that is not you. But you have to learn, because this is the kind of job that you communicate with the other network who can easily help you be able to achieve your goals. Or I'll tell you, share with you information that are useful for your organization. So listening, I would really urge everybody need to go back because I think a lot of us, we don't listen. And also putting ourselves into the shoes of the person you want to come with us. And I've learned through experience, when you ask a staff who is not performing, how can I help you achieve ABCD, they are, they, their face brightens. Because they're here, you want to help them. But when you quarrel them, how did you achieve, we did not achieve your target, then the approach is different. So I think less communication, in my view, is very important. The leader needs to be agile. You know, you, you can't be too rigid, fixed. You need to be flexible, because times are changing. Also, you need to be a decision maker. You also need, need to have the resilience to, to bounce back. You know, the fact that maybe in this particular that you didn't achieve all the targets this year, you should be able to bounce back. And that's why I want to submit to you, a good leader grows other leaders. If you work alone, you are not likely to go very far. You actually fail miserably. It must be you go out of your way to learn how to work with the others. You need to be adaptable, courageous, risk taker, and I would say actually you need to be humble. You see, in the traditional leadership, is it called the, the big man's theory? The big, you know the big man and the, the big woman? They are powerful, they make all the decision. When they come, we all kind of clear away. You see, but I think we understand now from evolution of leadership, 
when those who are humble, they always appreciate there are people within the room who know more than them. In Kenya School of Government or in Public Service Commission, I, I used to tell my staff, they need to know more than me. Because if I, they know just what I know, then I don't need them. So help them to know more than surround yourself with geniuses. I think that's what I find working. People who are smarter than you. If you are just having those who are just your level, you don't make those strengths. And also, appreciate alternative voice. I think Gundelin does appreciate alternative, but you can only uh, appreciate alternative voices if you are humble. Humble is also something that one can uh, learn. Courage, I think I've not seen anybody managing within turbulent time and they are not courageous enough to make a decision. Remember, as leaders, you are there to help uh, even the teams make decisions. But if you are indecisive because you don't have courage, then you just seem to mark time. Foresight, foresight means being able to see maybe what is likely to happen in this sector I am in three to five years time. You can also have design thinking. You, design thinking is very also, foresight and design thinking is a relatively new area that you, you look at the end, then work backwards. Good through experience, maybe we don't have the right skill mix. And for that reason, that's why we are not able to make a very good decision for running the organization because our governing body is not strong enough to make decision. I am also feeling with the time, every leader also need a broader perspective, including actually some global exposure. And I think that's why you find maybe reading literature, now things are a little bit easier through online, being able to travel, being able to have network, because that global exposure makes you understand uh, how things are changing and what you need to do in order to kind of manage the turbulence or navigate around the turbulence. What are my concluding thoughts? Dr. Purit, am I still doing okay with time? I think, okay. What are my concluding thoughts? Because I think I need to come to this point. Gundi leaders emerge during challenging times. Do you agree? Good leaders, if you don't, if you are waiting for things to get better so that you can now be seen, you are not a good leader. They should emerge during the challenging times. Number two is, this was quite interesting. Every generation imagines their challenge is the worst, and it is not true. <laughs> every generation, and even every people, they think, oh, this corona was the worst. Next time, or something else, they think it is the worst, but it is not true. Every turbulence, every challenging time will pass, and another one stronger will come. So prepare as a leader. Challenges, I think this is very common. Challenges can be turned into opportunities. I think you have realized in every organization, maybe, when there's restructuring, you might even have a better defined job description for the staff. Some might even get an opportunity to be promoted, and then the organization even might be, do better. So if the attitude is that uh, we, we don't change the challenges to opportunities, people skills, and especially partnership and collaboration skills are very important. It's, they're emerging. That if you never had a very good collaborative or partnership skills, this is what is emerging. And again, even in sustainable development goals, number 17 talks about partnership which nobody used to talk about that years ago. Because what you can do, we can do better today, together. You, that's why you find a lot of maybe organization partnering with others to be able to deliver. And of course, let me say also, within this partnership and collaboration, you can't collaborate unless you understand a broader area. For example, in Kenya, we are all pursuing Vision 2030. Therefore, you must look at as a collaborate in education one, the innovation 20 that they have for education. You must also look at all these sustainable development goals that the UN is pursuing, and every country has got their own plan how we implement sustainable development goals, which is about improving the quality of life for all and a better inclusive future. Then you must ask, but you also, you cannot forget even in African Union, we have Africa we want 2063. So that's what I'm saying as Alinda, you can never afford to have an, a narrow view. You must have a wide perspective, but also a very positive outlook. 
My other uh, uh, area is to succeed a leader and the followers are in one team. I think we have not spent a lot of time talking about followers here, but I thought maybe that is, is for another day. Because you can never, the success of a leader depends on the followers. But how are the followers? What time do we take maybe to develop our followers? It, it is very important. I'm also reminded, because I think in Kenya now, we have, we have reached a point where the way we are electing our leaders is no longer looking at the best leader who can deliver us from the social challenges that we have. We are just kind of looking at who, who is rich enough. They look now, some, if you don't have a lot of money, you cannot be. So, but we are the followers. We are the ones who elect them. It is not as simple as I'm saying, but we are, what we are trying to say, don't expect a leader who is having not very applied followers to succeed. So a leader, as a CEO, the followers, we must be all in the same team. And if we fail, we fail as a team, we succeed, we succeed as a team. Uh, my other concluding thoughts are on the same. Leadership involves long life learning. I think I, that one we agreed. If you just come to the level, where, uh, at the entry level, that's what you are relying on to lead the teams, it doesn't happen. Trust is very, very important. It's a secret because followers must tr trust their leader. But how do we build trust? You model the way, even at home, if you are your children and everybody else there, if the, you, your character is wanting, definitely then they cannot trust you. The same at the workplaces. How trust is very, very important. And we know there are many challenges why organizations are not moving, countries are not moving, because there, there is trust deficit. And I'm saying the trust, the followers must be trust the leader, the leader must trust the followers. So I think in the next lecture, take a little bit more time what we need to do for the followers. The, as we, of course we are talking about challenging times, but I would submit, let's embrace ourselves even for more challenging time. We are living in an environment that continues to be very volatile. You know, it's like if it's volatile, you also need to behave like water. You can fit in any corner. You know, that when you put water in a bottle like this, it will take the shape of the bottle. There are so many uncertainties. We don't know what will happen in three, four years' time. We, we have seen, even if, you know, when we are try, struggling with the policy of CBC, you find there are many things you can't see, you can't conceptualize, but then all of us, we are convinced. We want our children to have problem-solving skills. We want them to have critical skills. Ooh, which parent doesn't want to have that? All of us, we do. But still, when we try to kind of see there are quite a bit of uncertainties, things can be complex, goals change. You know, we could be pursuing this goal as a nation, but all of a sudden, another goal emerges. So depending on this. Also, we have to, as a leader, you have to start accommodating ambiguous. Don't, don't think look straightforward, they are likely not to be. Ambiguity has become one of the skills. I'm also saying, you don't just look at one side, for and against, advantages and disadvantages before you make a decision. And of course, I was going to ask, how long do you think a leader should stay in an organization? <laughs> I don't have an answer. But we, we, from the tradition point of leadership, leaders sometimes want to stay as long as it takes, but from current literature, we know leaders know when to leave. Are we together? Leaders know when to leave. So I think it comes a time that you, if you are a transformative leader, then you must have grown others, and when you leave, you should be comfortable that things are going to flow. There is a season for everything. You'll be here today, tomorrow somebody else is there. But what did you do to leave that legacy so that the institution uh, continued to, to, to kind of to perform? I want them to leave you with this last one. This being at the university, further research work is really, really required to establish how leadership has evolved. This is something a standard you can say. How has leadership evolved? Maybe in Kenya, since 1963, up to where we are. And you know leadership can be political, it can be religious, it can, you decide. 
A lot of people have argued the politicians are not leaders. Have you heard that? They would be very upset if you say that. But it's true, politicians are not leaders. But if you get a leader who is a politician, you are very good. So let's try to first grow leaders, then they can become politicians. They will make a perfect. But just where well, we're just having politicians sometimes, MCA, have you forgiven me? <laughs> first become a leader, then you become a politician. You will be able, because we are all submitting that leadership is about serving others. Therefore, in that case, then if you know how to serve others, even when you take a political position, you'll be able to be better. I'm also thinking there should be research done on the role of followers. What is the role of followers? What do we know about followers? I think we have not spent a lot of time. Uh, uh, sometimes we, we have put a lot of emphasis on the leader. And I would submit we need to have some research that shows what the role of the follower and what is the future of leadership? I think it's something that uh, we should, even as practitioners, as we start we sit here today, how do we see the future of leadership? Especially when the, 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 the future of work is changing and what is influencing it. The role of artificial intelligence, the, the, many, many the changes that are, the rapid changes are taking place globally. So we must be prepared to do those kind of studies that can give us evidence to inform policy and inform decisions. And with that, I really want to thank you for listening to me. Uh, what I've shared with you is what we agreed with Motua and, and the other colleague, that when we share this, you have an open mind. I don't have to have all the answers. There are other leaders here who can uh, answer that. But I think I want to stop here and thank you very much for those who are sitting here, those who are online. I'm very grateful to have had an opportunity really to make this public lecture on leading during in challenging times. I thank you. Seated. I think we can give our chief guests a very honest clap, isn't it? It's been an excellent, excellent evening of learning and relearning. Okay, so may we do factorial five, one, two, three, four, five, then one, two, three, four, one, two, go, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. One, two, a good one. One. We want to say thank you. Thank you, our chief guests. It's been exciting, very exciting to, to listen to you and to, and to learn and to be challenged. Allow me to quickly remind ourselves that the topic for today was leading in challenging times. And we can all reflect on that and the challenges that we've had since COVID-19. I think that's a latest. To quickly pick on some of the things I've picked, some tips on skills that we need to pick as leaders, or we need to grow as leaders. Networking, that was very clear. Work-life balance. Self-awareness. Ability to listen, to empathize, and to do things right and to grow other leaders. And then we were reminded that leadership is not about position. It is about service. Leadership is about results. Leadership is a determinant of what makes an organization succeed or fail. And then we were taken through many, many other very important lessons that leadership is about shared vision and that we need to transform ourselves first before we can transform organizations. And that um, we must have conceptual skills, long-term view, technical skills, interpersonal skills, and a leader is one who knows the way. 
and goes the way. And as the team with him, with her. And finally, because I want to save on time, that challenges can be turned into opportunities. And I think that's very, very critical, very important, that we shouldn't see challenges as challenges, but as opportunities. And to me, that was great. We want to say thank you, and thank you, and thank you, and God bless you in a very special way for accepting to be our chief guest tonight. We really appreciate, and I thank you to God for, for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. It's good to know that we had quite a good number of followers online. We understand the challenging times we are in. So we had a wonderful and good following online. So we want to thank all the online listeners for tuning in and for connecting and for listening. And therefore, before I am soon giving you a chance to ask questions, starting with Bishop Kefa, if you are on board, very soon, but allow me to recognize the presence of our DVC, DVCA Academy, uh, Administration and Planning, Dr. Peter Motua. That's, <laughs> thank you very much, um, our DVCA, Dr. Motua. Then online we have Justice Daniel Musinga. We want to say thank you, Daniel. And we are saying this also, and we are saying this also, and we are Yes, we recognize your presence and many other people that are present tonight. And we want to say thanks to all. A chance uh, to Bishop Kefa, if you're online, we can give, you can, we can have your, um, you can, we can rejoin them. Just a second for you to get the mic. mic. Yeah. Thank you again. My name is Dr. Edward Kobuthi, Commissioner of the Provincial Commission, but I've also one leg in academia. As Professor was talking, I, I picked one point. Leadership is the determinant in achieving goals. In the last two or so years, I've been listening a lot to a lot of debates, more so about China. Even the Western colleges, when they have their lecturers, the, the lectures such as this one, been focusing a lot on China. And as she was talking, I was, I, I, was, I was beginning to think, is there something the Chinese are doing that is relating to what she's trying to, to, to talk to us about? I th also remember when President Kibaki was the president of Kenya. One of the things I think he did, a lot of key people in, in the government were very, were, were recruited competitively. Might there be a nexus between what Chinese are doing, getting the, ve the very best, because I realized that was one of the lectures I was, li I was li listening to, to get into the, into, the, into the government of China, you need to be the best student in your, in your province. So, so the government is composed of very, very good men and women. I think that's what, what, what you also talking about doing here. Then finally, I think, Professor, if you can address the issue of now the public students who are no longer going to, to be admitted in the, in the private universities, how should the leaders, the VCs now navigate that that very turbulent, uh, that, that, that very turbulent occurrence. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We can have another question. Yes, at the corner there. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this insightful um, leadership. It actually demonstrates leadership, isn't it? Great. So um, my own is not a question, but uh, just a comment. Looking at what has been presented today, the self-awareness, that person, the intrapersonal relationship seems to take the lead. Because you, to be a leader, you got to be self-aware. You got to have the right qualities. That is what is coming out. 
And looking at our education system, uh, even as we emphasize skills, we need to really bring up life skills. Build those young people from childhood. And even as we build the children from childhood, we need to be able to also guide them to be good parents. Because the mental health status of a leader is very, very important. And the family influences, the, the, the formative stages are very significant for us to be able to build a leader that can actually spur development. So for the education sector, I think we need to make some changes to focus on the, the real person, even as we build the external uh, facilities, the infrastructure for this person to be uh, a good leader. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That's a comment, and thank you very much. Uh, I'll soon be ge giving a chance to the online participants after um, Yes. Thank you so much. It's, it's okay. You are okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. My name's uh once more Ibrahim Abdul Mohammed. I'm a PhD student at uh, KMU uh, undertaking health systems management. I'm a former CEC Health, CEC Finance from Ojea County. Thank you so much, Professor Margaret Kobia, for this timely lecture um, that we have been CS for public service and we have been uh, um, working at the, uh, as a commissioner at the Public Service Commission. Literally, uh, where I come from and the county I come from, actually the evolution was a success. But it also had, it actually it came also with all challenges, especially leadership. Leadership both for the national and the county governments uh, are not actually, uh, the rewards are not based on performance. It is based on loyalty, to be very uh, sincere. Because uh, when a governor, for example, a governor comes on board, uh, he rewards his uh, uh, team, whether they're competent or incompetent. Right now, as we speak, there are so many cases of uh, public, uh, public servants, you know, uh, who had issues with the county, and the petitions are right now at the Public Service Commission. There are a lot of issues with the public uh, service in the counties, and that's basically the mindset of uh, the county governors. Unless, unless we do something about it, I think we shall close uh, the doors of all counties in this country. So literally. I know there's nothing much we can do about it, but now from your experience and where you come from, uh, what can we do about it and where, where, you, where are you going? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for oh, that question and those questions. I thought we can first have, take one more. Okay, we take one more. And after this set, we are going to have the online participants ask. Okay, thank you. Good evening, okay. everyone. Good evening, okay. everyone. Good. My name is David Chumba. I work with the National Police Service at uh, Police Air Wing. So um, I'm actually delighted to be one of the participants here today, um, uh, Professor uh, Margaret Kovia. Uh, that was a, a good presentation, and um, I really um, admire your career profession. And um, since I'm also in the public service, I really want to follow your footsteps. And um, I'm, I'm also aware that uh, you are one of the directors at uh, Kenya School of Government, which was initially called um, Kenya Institute of Administration. And hap I'm happy to report to you that I'm an alumni of um, Kenya School of Government. I've undergone um, several courses there. Uh, first, I started with um, a supervisory development course, and then the second one, a senior management course, and currently undergoing um, SLDP, strategic leadership management. And I'm happy, and um, for those of us who don't know Kenya School of Government, um, if you go to Kenya School of Government, the reception, um, the reception area 
is actually named Margaret Copia. So she left a landmark there. Everyone who goes there, she is received at the uh, reception, uh, and the billboard is written Margaret Copia. So well done, uh, Professor Margaret Copia, and we look. I look forward to interacting with you in future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was um, a compliment. Thank you very much. Most most appreciated. Now there are questions from the online team. Um, uh, the question is, shed light on emerging trends in leadership. Emerging trends on, in leadership. And the second question, uh, I think you addressed this, an old time quotation, are leaders made or born? I think that was um, covered. But our comment, uh, the, the comment is required on this. So with that, allow me to welcome our chief guest again to respond to those comments and great questions that have been posed. Welcome. Thank you very much for the questions that have come from the floor and also from those online. You know, when you get questions, you get the feedback that the audience was with you. I thank you. <laughs> from the get the best from their people to serve in the public service because I think they believe and I think if you, if you look also many years ago in Kenya public service that's why public service was established so that you can recruit the best and give them jobs for to work in the public service because it's public service is their, job, their role is to serve so I think where their role is to serve so I think we, um, it's not just generally the whole issue of meritocracy, it is the right direction to go. And I think all of us should be able to raise our concern or voices out when you find incompetent people given positions. But we have uh, also a difficulty because when it comes to political position, we know how politics play around the area. But if you are doing these other institutions which are not political, and we also depoliticize them, I think we need to really go for the best. And right now, because of the exposure in education and the devolution, as it was pointed out, you can't miss a county which doesn't have their best of the best. So you cannot say, oh, long time ago, oh, there's nobody coming from Pocomo who can take this position of a district officer. So I think meritocracy, they, that is what actually leaders should go for. And uh, within, within our constitution also we are so besides me merit, you can look at the regional balancing because that's where we are. But still within that regional balancing and also inclusion, you can still get the best. So I think it's the right direction to go. And I think then we must ask ourselves, what are we going, we don't just talk about it. We must find a solution. Because I think if you are Linda and you are only talking about the challenge, I think you you are not really fulfilling your role. Your leader should be able to see a problem and decide what they can do. For example, I can imagine this International Leadership University having a really program to reach out, maybe in the I'm combining with your question from the county, to reach out those people who, who have been appointed in this position and maybe they don't have the competencies required. But the right place to get is at recruitment, then, we, then you can train them when they have already joined. That's what would make a difference. And I'm sure even also wherever you have been, you have seen when you have been given an incompetent leader, you don't go very far. It frustrates everybody, including the followers. The second uh, comment was self-awareness. That is very, very important. Self-awareness, I think there's a lot I was reading an article which was trying to argue that um, the role of emotion to the leadership. You can also say the role of emotional intelligence to leadership because it's if you don't understand self, and I could even put self mastery, how do you explain when all of us in a lot of places we cannot keep time? That's simple, isn't it? 
But a self-master is, is, is the, you are able to organize yourself to have honor and discipline if you are really going, those are the basic, if you are going really to become a good leader. So I think it's important that uh, take, let's take time. Because unless you are self-aware, you might not be able to motivate another person, you might not be able to empathize, because first, it's very important to spend time on these soft skills of self-awareness. Unfortunately, they might not be taught, but when you are leadership student, I think this is where you should start uh, looking for literature. And uh, nowadays, because of digital of technology, you can teach yourself almost anything, even through YouTube. Do you know that? You can go to the YouTube, search what you are looking for, listen. In fact, that's what I'm doing nowadays. Because I'm in a season where I'm not very busy. So if I want to learn something, recently for those who are in, in um, academics, there is a, it might not be new, but for me it was new. There is a new uh, application or a software where when you are doing your literature review, Sotero is already able to do your references. Are we together? When you are already doing your literature review, looking at many articles, this, when you type it, it is able to do your references. By the time you finish, your references are ready. When I was going to school, long time ago, references could make you even miss a graduation. Because now you have done all your dissertation, you have done everything, now you are, well, then you realize by the time your dissertation or your thesis is accepted, your references are not right. Then you know, which means you come to the graduation next. So technology has really simplified things, and I think that's why the whole issue of being aware of what can you do and what can you, where can you learn from, there's a lot of learning that you can take online for all of us. Anything, it is out there. We only need to know what do you really, uh, we say technology is both and a wedged sword. You can also waste a lot of time in it, isn't it? <laughs> but you need to know what do you really need. Uh, Self-mastery, self-awareness, and uh, emotional intelligence, all that, I think is very important. You can also do quite a lot of that online before you look at where else to go. Uh, the role of the life skills, of course, and I think starting from families is very important. We role model for our children, isn't it? Role modeling is so important because there's no way Alinda say, I might be wrong. You know, in my time, you know, coming at eight was very important, as if you came at seven is very important. But today, it's not the time you come. It's the result you are able to, to generate. So, but if, we, if you are in there and you are not generating any results, then you lose credibility. And then even if you tell one of your team members to do ABCD, they won't be able to do it because you have not role modeled uh, that way. If you are saying you should not um, talk behind the tent to the supplier, <laughs> grounding a lot of people think to get a job, you must know somebody, until your parents think that way. You know, we can normalize. But as leaders, how can we change that? Some of these things are looking normal. That for my son to get a police job, sorry, I'm my colleague, <laughs> they need, or KDF, or they need, when, it, when it's not even true. So I think we have started normalizing, and I think we didn't need to work hard to turn the tide so that we always say challenges, political leadership that is not right, fight between deputy and the governor. That alone, once the governor and the deputy are fighting, there is nothing that can happen because there are people below who are looking at them. So I think let's look for a way, uh, VC, that even if we don't, can we at least do a study document and come up with a way forward? What some of the things? Sometimes I don't believe it's because they don't know. I want you also to think, do those people in the county where we have devolved everything wrong? Is that because they don't know? There's, there's something else. We need to find what it is and how a lot of counties we see we have devolved so many billion, but there's nothing to show. So I think the whole issue of human resource in the counties has become, been a big problem. I think we need to think around it. The whole issue of doctors in the counties, because now for the seven counties, I've got different type of employers. That, is, that alone also is also, and I think some work is going on to do, can we have a health commission that brings all this uh, together? So, counties, we have a big problem. The purpose why devolution was meant to bring services and the power to the people, but much as it has worked, 
We don't know if it's a 150 percent, 60 percent. We need also to study what is it. 70 percent. I would not think maybe 40 percent. The rest of it is not working very well, and that it has to do with the leadership. Where the leadership is right, and I'm sure all of you know some counties where things have happened very well. I think the Ibu. Then we come to transition and get a very good governor in this season. The next season you get another one too. So this is a challenge we have kind of, we will continue looking maybe for a solution because uh, it, it is a real, real problem. The resources are not being used for the right purpose. Then um, what can be done? I think still we don't give up. We voice it and even if it means going to any forum where we can be able to say that we think in the counties we could do better by a good proposal. A good proposal from faculty, from the university, it would be good when you're collecting data. And even if it's one county or two, you can be able to say from this, we are, can be able to recommend one, two, three. But giving up is not an option. For our lead leaders never give up. And the breakfast for leaders is feedback. You know, it is very handy for people to get feedback. People don't like reaching for feedback. But the good leaders ask for feedback so they can know where to improve. David uh, Chumba, yes, thank you very much for the comment. And uh, at least you have been to Kenya School of Government and you know that strategic leadership program team helped us to put together. With a, it was the team that said, It was in the team that said yes, as we become Kenya School of Government. People, when they come, they go through induction program, they do senior management, maybe that year or something. By the time they are 10 years in the service, they do policy analysis. By the time they are becoming level director or peers, they need a strategic leadership course. So you can see the government also understand we have to evolve to give them the skill to the directors and the peers. And I think it continues we are kind of and getting more content. Please, I would wish you could look at it and see how well is this doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's the question from online, a very interesting one. I, I wish somebody else can also help me answer one. Now, what are the emerging trends? What, what are some of the emerging trends for the leaders now? Of course, visioning is very, is, 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 you can't, the fact that um, you are leadership position you must be able to vision what, what is it that you want to do. Because unless you are a leader can be able to put a plan in line with the, the either mandate of that organization. So we are also seeing there are many skills that leaders need to learn to be able to remain relevant. And I think I mentioned the, the way the environment is and for you to become relevant to the environment, you must retool yourself, you must train, you must be able to kind of network. So I think there are many trends and I think I could also recommend there is a, a lot of literature on the future of work and how it's changing and how people need to position themselves. Yeah, so I think I'll leave it there. I have not really done justice to it, but they, they, they are completed. They were, and I talked about evolution. The Linda of 20 years ago or 50 is very, cannot cope with today's environment. And also, let me also talk about, um, again, from the China case. You know, having merit meritocracy only, or having the best competent person, but the environment is polluting, it doesn't help. Are we together? Work environment must be aligned with the competencies. For somebody, I mean, you know, we know, especially from where I've worked, some, somebody can, you can be told X is useless doesn't do any work. In fact, let's transfer them to very far. But you talk to X and put him in another department, he performs. What changes? The environment. Maybe he feels supported, he's valued, he's motivated. So work environment in terms of supervisor support, being given the equipment, because now even we to talk about digital technology and there's no internet, even if you had the best brains. So I think let's also see the holistic what it needs to be put in place for people to perform as leaders. But a good leader also will know what is needed and then be able to kind of find a way of getting that. Are leaders born or made? I think that's a question which has been there since the literature of leadership. Of course, that's why they are saying, okay, leaders are born, that's why you see the queen, the king, and all those, those are born in those streets. 
But that has been argued, no, leaders are not born. It's not because of traits. Because there are many people with the traits, but they are not leaders. So all those traits which are described. So then they say, it's about what they do. And I think that's why there's a good persuasion that leadership can be learned. You are lucky if you have the traits, but you can, you are, you'd be useless if you don't learn. Because that's why I said leadership is lifelong learning. So I think I want to stop here so that I can, uh, I think we are running short of time. And this, in a public lecture, things don't stop. You find a new area so, to continue with the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really wouldn't, didn't wish you to sit because there are just two questions from the online. <laughs> and this will be the last questions along us because of time. The, the last two questions, one is from Engineer Peter Jero. We recognize your presence, Engineer. And this question is, one challenge successfully in that phase is knowing when to exit. Please give some guiding principles on how to navigate this phase in a leader's journey. That's from Engineer Peter Jero. And the last question is, there seems to be a big gap between the quality of leadership in our public and private sector. Why is this so? And what should we do to narrow this gap from better service delivery? That is from friend, Magomere. Thank you, friend, and most welcome. As um, our chief guest comes, I recognize the presence also of our uh, DVC investment, Dr. Beatrice Njenga. So welcome, those will be our last questions. And after that, I would call on a VC um, to do some. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I think with this question from Engineer Jero, the uh, current member of the council, when do leaders, does the leader know when to leave? This is a governance question, isn't it? Uh, of course, if you look at like in the public service, the mongozo which guides when in people, when you are appointed, maybe as a CEO, you do three years, and then that is in public service, and then renewable ones. That means you have done how many years? Six. In maybe councils and the board of directors, they are also appointed for a, a period because it is believed that. You can, as a leader, because it's quite a challenging position, and that is my view, that you cannot be there for at least more than 10 years. Universities, you have seen five years VC renewable ones. So I think there's a reason, because as a leader, you must be aware what that you come to do. When I was at Kenya School of Government, I was there for eight and a half years. But by the time I finished writing that, Kenya School of Government Act, and that time feeling like I need to leave. Uh, th that is me. Maybe another person is different. And they started to feel that if I've delivered the act and the Kenya School of Government has turned from KIA to Kenya School of Government, it's about time I moved on. And I was thinking I should go back to teaching. But at the same time, that is when Public Service Commission was coming up after the Constitution 2010. Somehow another opportunity came. So I think a leader should not be in a position, especially in the public service, for more than 10, 10 years, in my view. And if, of course, that depends if he is performing and uh, everybody is in agreement, he has demonstrable results, that's why we are keeping X, Y, and Z. Then uh, another area I would think um, a leader also should have, a leader does not operate alone. You have a board. You have also management team. They should be able to give you a feedback. If you should say, hang on, or you should go, because you don't even have to do the 10 years if you are not performing. So it's a governance issue. It is different from a private sector. If I'm running my own company, and I'm the CEO, you see, my, my motivation and my performance purely depends with the goals of my organization. So private sector is governed by different uh, type of governance. But in public service, I think there's a limitation how long 
one can stay in a CEO position and it is already in a document called Mongoso, code of, code of governance for state corporations in, in Kenya. Private sector, I think people are, if they are private, it will also have its own governance. If it's a, a kind of um, owned by, you know, like a family business, that's one you can't, it's up to them to decide. But you could also have uh, a listed company. They have also a governance, how, they, what they should, they, how long they should go. Of course, overstaying, and that's why even uh, for elected position, you go to ask for mandate after a certain time, five years. So there must be a good theory why people have a certain duration. Because that is not the only position you can be since we said leadership is not a position. You can go to something else and still serving people. The number two question from a um, friend, the, the gap between public servants and the private sector. I'm not sure if I got your question right, because I know also in the public service, there are brilliant people there. I, I know for many years, the, mo the cream of the country worked for the public service. But the complexity of the public sometimes may make people in private sector look like they are the one performing better. We have even gone further and brought people from private sector to public service. They failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Fred, I might not have the, the right answer here, but I think um, leadership really is the determinant. In public service, the people can do very well. Uh, I, I mean, when you look at the public service, when you, when you see the hospital, when you see the school, when you see the roads, th those are public servants who do it. So we cannot forget that the public servants deliver on a lot of things. So we, we should also recognize it's only that the public service is a very complex environment that sometimes not one leader gets a credibility. And the fact that also every five years a, a new leadership comes, but the public servants who are there I would say they are actually first class. And if meritocracy continues to be the guiding principle, then I, should, I think we should have the right public servants and also give them the right environment. Because if you don't give them the right environment, even if you recruit them by the merit, so we must see what works. What works in public service for people to perform? What works in universities for people to perform? So unless we bring that on the table, it becomes uh, difficult. So I want to stop here. Thank you very much, VC. I, then, I was told you are the next to speak. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, has it not been an insightful evening? Yes. Very, very encouraging. And especially from one who finished well. Yes. I told her that's one of the things I really heralded her for. Because it's not easy to pa work in public service for the period of time she has been in and not a mention of a scandal in a country like Kenya. Isn't that not great? It's an encouragement to us. And uh, Madam Guest Speaker, you are an encouragement to us in our vision of developing leaders of integrity who can bring transformation. And that's what we really have uh, had tonight. In addition to those of us who are here, I was just informed that uh, at the peak of it, we had about 440 following online. So I just want to encourage you that you have influenced many other people uh, from across this country and even beyond. Of course, as a new world now we are in, more people now want to just watch, <laughs> follow online, and uh, yet they'll be influenced positively with the values that uh, we've talked about tonight. So thank you to each one of you. My role is just to really usher our team from the School of Leadership and Governance. Uh, I think they should be represented here <laughs> with the two of our leaders here. On, on behalf of the dean who is out of the country, uh, they would like to make a, sh a presentation to you and uh, allow me to request you to just come.
Dr. Gitonga to round off for us. But thank you again, every one of you, for coming. It's a real delight and honor to have uh, hosted you here. And we'll come again. Uh, this is what uh, this is in the DNA of the International yeah. Leadership University. So come again. If you enjoy tonight, you'll enjoy the programs and other interactions. May I also make special uh, recognition of uh, Mr. Gitonga. We are very glad you could join us tonight. <laughs> and for the support you give to this very special lady here, <laughs> Dr. Purity Gitonga. Asante sana. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, our VC. We are now coming to the end of the program. May I say it's been a great pleasure for me to lead this program. Um, my name is Purity Gitonga and part of uh, the ILU family. Allow me now to welcome uh, Dr. Jackie Mutua to give a vote of thanks, but once more, very special thanks to our chief guest tonight, Professor Margaret Kobia, for taking us through leading in challenging times. God bless you in a very, very special way. Okay. Af after our vote of thanks, uh, we are going to have Susan Kibi to lead us in the closing prayers. And may God bless you and travel well. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank God uh, for giving us this opportunity to be able to be here tonight for this lecture. You know, if he, hasn't, he hadn't granted us that opportunity, we wouldn't be here. And going on, um, we give our heartfelt thanks to our chief guest. Thank you for coming and sharing your experience, your life, your wisdom. Our Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the, thy word says that all a man's way seems pleasant unto him, but you are the one who gives us success and accomplishment. We planned, we prepared, but you've given us the victory we needed. We want to thank you so much for each one of us who had attended, those who are here and those who are online, and we believe that there's something we've gained today that is going to be very useful in our individual lives in our uh, respective organizations and also in our families and even for ILU. Lord, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for our guest speaker. Today she has shared with us, based on what she has learned from what other scholars have discovered and from her many years of experience, we want to say thank you because today as she stands there, she can only say Ebenezer. And from her well of knowledge, her well of experience, she was kind to come and share with us. We say thank you. Thank you for all the organizers who took time, who participated in one way or the other. And the platform that ILU has given, we want to say thank you. Thank you for all those who have taken trouble to be here with us today. And those who in one way or the other have contributed, we want to say thank you, O oh Lord. Mighty God, we continue to ask you to give us more chances and more platforms that we, can, that we may empower our nation and beyond with leadership skills, oh God. This lecture has served as a strengthener, further of our mandate, as ILU, where we are supposed to, to, to develop leaders of integrity. Father, we thank you because this is a step further. Thank you for our vice chancellor. Thank you for all leaders in this institution. And as we continue growing, oh God, Father, from them that have heard about us today, may you give us favor and acceptance that this will serve to enlarge our institution, that we may be able to fulfill the vision and the mandate that you've given to us. Lord God Almighty, we want to say thank you once again. And as we are leaving this place, we want to pray for protection. We want to pray that you surround us with your protection. As we are driving back home, Lord, be with us. And as we get back home, we will say all the glory back to you. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Karibu ILU, come and study. Thank you. Once again, you are most appreciated and you are dismissed with the love of God. 
May the grace of God be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.